Hello, everybody, and thank you, Bob, and thank you, Larry Turner. It's an honor to uh, be here uh, representing uh, the industry and uh, being a guest of uh, CFE Media and uh, the Hanover Mesa organization because those are two really great organizations that I, I kind of think of it as they like to bring us together to have these conversations that we need to have and get away from our day-to-day -day jobs and really think strategically about what we're doing. So those two partners, I think for all of us, are doing a great job, and I, I'm honored to be here on the, at their request. So, so uh, welcome to your next 30 or 40 minutes. Um, I want to put it in perspective first. What you're getting from me is I'm like your IoT warm-up band, okay? So you're not getting the deep technical thing from me. I'm just going to try to condition your brain a little bit. That's what I'm going to do. And then the next set of speakers and panels, then we can hammer them with all the really tough stuff, right? So, so I'm going to try to warm you up to this at the end of your lunch and heading into the good discussions. And hopefully I entertain you a little bit and make you laugh and we enjoy just the start of this. So with that, um, this is the, uh, the title of, our, of my chat with you today. And so on the way to our digital future, and uh, we at Phoenix Contact typically use this image at times because it, it renders many things in your mind when you stare at that image. Um, two that I want you to think about uh, first is one, where we're going with automation and control is into this IoT world and it, and it has to be a little like this. I see two things there that are very important. One, intimacy. We've had robotics and automation for many, many years, but it was sort of a wall between the human and the machine. This picture suggests an intimacy, an interaction. You're gonna get deeply involved in that world far more than you ever believed. And then the second thing, a handshake often represents trust, right? I mean, that's what a handshake is. You, it's a greeting but it can actually represent trust. Well, in the end, sooner or later, you're gonna have to trust these highly interactive, highly intelligent systems to take care of your business for you. So that's the way I wanted to start it off. This is on your way to the digital future and how we're gonna interact with that future. Quick commercial on who my company is and who I am. So if you're not familiar with Phoenix Contact, no, we are not from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we are a privately held German company um, in the north of Germany. Uh, our heritage is we were a terminal block manufacturer first, just the simple connections of the wires in an industrial system. And now we make everything all the way up to industrial PCs, software. So the complete, I like to think of us as an automation infrastructure provider. Um, we give you all the bits and pieces you need to put the system together. And then the picture on the right, uh, this is compliments, uh, of the Hanover Mesa organization, I was honored enough to, you know, Larry gave you my introduction, so this is my big eight minutes of fame. I got to stand next to uh, Chancellor Merkel and President Obama, and uh, yes, that is the only time I wear a suit if, uh, when I'm with heads of state or if I have to at a wedding. Other than that, I never wear a tie. But uh, that was my big moment. I got, to, I got to meet the big guy and the big lady in this world uh, in, in April at Hanover Mesa. So, Let's do this. How about we start off with the lowest tech analogy that I can come up with for what is IIoT or Industry 4.0. This is how I introduced myself to this topic a year or two ago. So I like to think about house cleaning, right? So it started out many, 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 many years ago. You got the little old lady in a broom and you're sweeping up the floor or your steps, right? That's what maybe the first generation of this was. And then all of a sudden, you know, industry came along 50 years ago, invented uh, motors, metals, plastics, and uh, inventions abound. And we come up with this wonderful, I guess that would be like a Kirby today, very heavy duty vacuum cleaner, semi-automatic process. Uh, as you see, the lady's very proud of it, but she's lugging that thing around and getting the job done, but, but not really that advanced. And then, the last wave of industry that we went through was we, we optimized that process, right? We looked at the vacuum cleaner and made it really cool, high-tech plastics. You know, Dyson got into it and all these guys. And you make the process semi-automatic. Things are getting really good. Lights are on those things. 
little spinny wheels, little special attachments, and it just optimized the original invention. But I think this is where we are now. So we all know you have a little Roomba, and then the, I don't even know what the name of this one is. And what, it, what can you have now? You can have that whole process completely run autonomously, right? Um, it, it sends signals when the, when the bag is empty or whatever, that drawer must be in there. The battery knows when it needs to be replaced. It tells you when it's having problems and you know, it recharges automatically overnight. So I think this is kind of where we're going on the whole IIoT thing in manufacturing. We're gonna end up with things more like the infamous you know, automatic vacuum cleaner of today. All right, now I wanna break it down first of all. Um, there's two topics, 4.0 and IIoT, and I'm going to introduce you to those two topics and explain the differences. Really, there's not much difference, but they're two points of view, I guess you could say. Um, first and foremost, um, from an industry 4.0 perspective, this is a really great statement that I think sums it all up for us. It's about intelligent connection of business processes, things, systems, components, and humans being the basis of this fourth industrial revolution. So this is an EU-centric view. This was German-led and EU-centric. It's coming out of Europe. And these three bullets really sum it up for us, I think. It's the digitalization of that production and product life cycle. Don't forget the product word there, the product itself gets digitalized. It's the technical integration of cyber physical systems that's the human interaction with the physical, with the cyber system. And the Internet of Things and services coming into play like they never have before. And lastly, this new value add business model that can make all this work. So that's what's coming at us. All those words are going to retool what I think today we think automation and control is or the way you automate a plant or a factory. So. What it'll turn into are those simple words, right? You got smart products and systems that turn into smart factories, and then you add smart services that you never really thought much about in the past. So those three vectors are gonna come at you if you're a manufacturing uh, entity. Now, the US approach is not as organized, okay? Classic US way to go at things. We sort of let it happen on its own at first, and that's what happened. A couple of groups got formed. The Industrial Internet Consortium now is a bunch of companies pulling together a story. There was separately something called the Smart Manufacturing Leadership Coalition. The Industrial Consortium, this is their mission statement. They want to start working groups to coordinate and establish priorities and, and enabling technologies to leverage the Internet. And, and accelerate the adoption of all this and reduce barriers to entry. Look at the names on the board. You can see why they would want us all to put our factories highly on the internet because of who they are. And then GE, of course, big industrial uh, player wanting to be part of it. The SMLC, they came along and they built a model. And what they're trying to do is create platforms and test beds to prove things out, okay? You will have other Entities involved, smart cities, smart grids, there's all kinds of smart coalitions getting together to test this stuff out in their own industry or workspace. <clears throat> so we have a lot of stuff going on. And then yes, our government did get involved. Um, President Obama launched what are known as the National Network of Manufacturing Innovation. If you're not familiar with this, it takes a little while to hunt and click and learn it. But of several years ago, President Obama wanted to start what he felt would have been a collaboration of government, industry, and academia to start tackling and organizing this issue that we're talking about. And he created seven institutes. And I've highlighted the top two because they think they have the most applicability to this topic. The others do also. But if you think about additive manufacturing and 3D printing, and you think about digital manufacturing, you know, in integrated digital design and manufacturing, those are the two biggies that come right at the heart of what we're talking about. I would encourage all of us to get involved with those institutes. It's not hard to do it. There's some money, only a little bit, but you can just go there, see them, visit them, learn from them. 
And uh, I think we can all push these efforts, and they're doing very, very well. I think there was a speaker this morning, as a matter of fact, uh, 9.30 this morning, the, the leader of the America Makes, the additive manufacturing, spoke uh, at this conference. So the U.S. is what, right? It's a little wild, wild west of IIoT, not necessarily organized like the Europeans, but basically tackling the same topic. All right, now I'm going to head off away from manufacturing for a few moments, uh, get our minds conditioned, like I said I would earlier, on the topic by using lots of analogies and other information. So let's see what we can learn from Amazon. Uh, I ran into this chart about a year ago. Uh, this has two lines on it. This is retailing, okay? So this is you and I buying things. Um, the blue line is traditional department stores. The overall monthly sales, the index on the left, think in billions, 10, like the, uh, the, the 10,000 would be 10 billion. So it's in, the blue line shows you that somewhere between 12 and 18 billion a month is being sold in traditional department stores. And then the red line is online shopping. So think Amazon, right? So just look what's happened in 20 years. Now 80% of our shopping, roughly dollars, is going on over the internet. And then now you know why Macy's, all the traditional department store companies are dealing with declining volumes and closing and they, they're trying to make their online indemnity exist. But it's a massive, massive change that went on there. I mean, when you think about we are spending 40 billion a month online to buy stuff. Who here doesn't buy something on Amazon? Think about it for a minute. I, my life five years ago, nothing came to my house from Amazon. Today, there is a box every day arriving at my house from Amazon. I mean, that's, that's what this is all about. Crazy trend, amazing transformation of an industry. So what's happening with, what's this internet thing doing to us? New, bot, new business models are getting created every day. We all love the Uber stories um, and, and many, many, many more. It's all about mobile internet access now. I think the phone, the smartphone has really driven this. Um, you got to have secure transactions and that's what we're all struggling with right now, the security of our data and the privacy of our data. Things are getting smarter by the minute. The expanded choice is amazing. Back to the Amazon story too, I mean, I'm amazed at the things you can buy on Amazon and the choices you have within any sort of category. You, you never imagined you could have that much choice in the palm of your hand. Um, the big data st stuff is enhancing your customer experience. They know more about you and me than we know about ourselves. And uh, service is clearly a huge differentiator by this trend. So that's that. Now I like to say, let's see what we can learn from Tesla. Okay, Tesla's a, a big, big name big mover these days. There's the Model S we all know about. Um, I don't know if you know, but uh, at the end of last year, they announced how many Model S's they sold. They sold 50,000 Model S's. You say that doesn't sound like too many cars. Look it up. Um, Mercedes sold 50,000 Model S class cars, and Audi sold 50,000 a 8 roughly the Model S from Tesla size automobile roughly the price point of the Model S, of the Tesla Model S. Five years ago, Audi and Mercedes would have had those 50,000 cars. Tesla now has those 50,000 cars. In other words, they would have sold each 75,000 each. They, there's a thing going on here, and it's, if you really think Tesla's just this little hula hoop, it's not. Think about what they achieved in five years in taking away 50,000 of the most profitable cars that Mercedes and Audi were selling and shifted them to a startup from a guy that likes shooting rockets up. So anyway, amazing what went on there. This is the traditional powertrain for a car that we all know. We're in, we're in the base of, if you will, the automotive industry here. If we look across the lakes and look at Detroit, there's a lot of powertrain plants in Detroit and around this country making engines, transmissions, that's what it kind of looks like. You got the engine there in the front, maybe the tranny there in the back, whatever. This is what Tesla's powertrain looks like. A Little bit different. Can you imagine building a manufacturing plant that's building that versus that? You don't really have one. You pretty much have a body and assembly plant. You build a frame, you snap two motors and, a, and, you, and you slide a battery underneath and bolt it on. 
So can you imagine what's gonna happen to these powertrain plants over the next decade if this is what the powertrain becomes? Crazy thoughts. And if you don't think it's hitting mainstream, you know, yes, the Model S is a $100,000 automobile, plus or minus 20. Uh, this car will be available this fall. Yesterday, they announced the range on this. Chevy has come up with the Bolt. This is Tesla's Model 3 that's going to come out a year from now. Chevy's going to beat them by a year. And that has 238-mile range on one charge. And that car can be purchased for $35,000 before incentives, and you get $7,500 off from the government. So you can get under thirty grand a 240-mile range electric car from Chevy starting in a few months. It's hitting Main Street. It's not a fad, gang. It's coming. And then we all have heard many, many times about the Google car and things like Uber. Uber. Believe me, this autonomous driving thing is going to happen. It's not a trend. And if you're one of the non-believers that thinks because Tesla had two accidents that killed people, do the math on how many miles they drove and how many people die in regular cars on those same miles and how many lives they saved by having autonomous driving in their cars. It's not even a conversation. We lose 30,000 humans in this US a year to car accidents. If you use the autonomous driving technology that Tesla has today, you would save 90% of those lives. So yes, 10% of the people would still die in an autonomous car, but you would save 90,000, 90% or 27,000 lives if we all had autonomous cars tomorrow. So it's gonna happen, it's a big deal. So what's gonna go on in the automotive world only? Let's think automotive world economics only, right? You have e-powertrains coming at you fast and furious. The internet is at the core. If you own a Tesla Model S, you go to your garage in the morning and all of a sudden they download a new software and you have to sometimes learn where the new buttons are. They dump new data, new iOS is into your car overnight while you're sleeping. You don't even get to choose. They're much lower costs. Just think of that powertrain look. Yeah, I know the battery's costly, but that cost is coming down dramatically. The, the car can be a lot lower cost. As I said, autonomous driving's coming. It's not a fad. It's not, it's not a tech fad. It's really going to happen. People may not even own cars. You, you, this, this whole Uber thing is more than just a taxi. It's a way for you to really economically get around with just your phone. And I, and I think the new young generation, they're gonna go snap up cars like we old farts do, because we, we identify them with them. They're part of our culture, our heritage, our history. We love cars. Young kids today, I'm not sure they're gonna think that way. The car's gonna be an appliance to get them somewhere, just like the phone is an appliance to take them places too. And then if you think, I, Uber, Uber's been phenomenal. I love it. I'll be taking an Uber here in about three hours to get back to the airport. But Google, I think, is focused on them. And I made a joke there. They'll call it Goober. But um, you don't need drivers. If, if I'm going to the airport for 20 minutes in a car, I don't really need a driver. I also don't need a fancy BMW. I just need a piece of plastic with a soft seat. And I get there. And that's coming really, really fast. And then I think big oil has an even bigger problem because man, oh man, if even 20 to 30% of the cars in this country go to, go to electric, you just go see how many gallons of fuel that takes out of the system. It's a lot. Anyway, so what does it mean for manufacturing? Here's a couple of images, low cost robotics. Okay, this show's got tons of this going on. I'm not a robotics guy. I just put an image of a cheaper looking robot. I hope I don't disrespect anybody in the room if you if you make that robot but they're getting lower cost every day they're taking on functions that that are now economical to do believe me this is going to be amazing um, these robots can build bridges that's a bridge I think in Holland if you haven't seen this um, they put two robots on a little track to get started. I think actually it built the initial track too. They were autonomous robots. They built that bridge without any human touching them. Think of a 3D printer kind of analogy. They built the bridge without anybody doing it. So that's what a robot can do today. And then let's talk about 3D printers. Here's a great look. Starts out with this big monstrous looking 3D printer, right? And it's printing a model of a, of a formula car of some sort. Yeah, 3D printers are coming and they're coming really fast. Did you really know, um, there's a few ladies in the room, did you know you can 3D print shoes? I think every woman should be so excited about 3D printing because can you imagine this? In their closet at home, they have this 3D printer. 
So they pick out their outfit the night before and they just print the shoes they want while they're sleeping. They wake up that next morning, they wear the shoes and then they throw them away. I think this is the most amazing thing for a woman to be able to 3D print her own shoes. I just, it's coming, you can do it today. Um, I was also amazed to know that you can 3D print an entire gun and it works. So you can just go home and type it in and you'll have a gun tomorrow. That's pretty amazing to me. So where am I going with this? All of this, I'm gonna take it to the simplest analogy Think stack lights. So if you go into a factory, there are these little lights to tell you it's the process is running well or not. Stack lights are probably as low on the technology totem pole as you can get, right? A couple of bulbs and some wires and some metal and some lenses. This is made by Banner Engineering. It's an awesome product. It's LED based, wirelessly controlled, changes colors dynamically, and it could be on the internet. This one I don't believe is, but you could just do it with internet capability as well. So that's what we're doing. We're adding that much sophistication to something as simple as a stack light. So I, there's my first industrial thing for you all to think about. Um, there's the bottom of the totem pole and we're going to work up from there. Okay, so if IOT is changing the world, it sure will be changing manufacturing. I IOT will. Um, complete engine powertrain plants are going to have to change. Autonomous driving and the Google, Google Apple car will dramatically change this whole automotive economics, in my opinion. Oil and gas investment will be stagnant for years. They're going to have to reinvent themselves on a different level. I think the fundamentals of the supply chain will be completely rewritten. Think about, think about those 3D printers. You could print the parts that you need on the line instead of ordering from a supplier. So, so, so manufacturers could become their own parts suppliers if they wanted. And then everything should and could be wireless, connected, and highly, highly automated. So what is Phoenix Contact doing with all this? We were asked to tell you a little bit about our own experience. So we are a manufacturer of, of parts, pieces, components. We make millions of things a year for industry. This is the look of what our factories are turning into, very automated. If I take an example of a single product that we make, this is a small, thin, analog um, conditioner, signal conditioner. It has many, many varieties. That is a picture of the production line that we build it on, and that is an operator. Basically, an operator now is a technician. We don't have people assembling things anymore. The machine assembles everything. Not only does it assemble everything, it'll give that product its unique personality in the manufacturing process. So it's highly digital, highly database driven, and all the various operations are highly automatic. And as I said, our operators are technicians. Yes, they bring some componentry to the beginning of the line. Yes, they might package the product a little bit at the end of the line, but they program the system, they fix, they, they fix the system, and they run it. So they have a very diverse job as a factory operator today and a very high tech factory operator job. So that's what we're doing in our factories. Um, and then it, we're also asked to share with you maybe how we've solved some of these problems in industry. Well, first of all, as I said, we make a lot of this infrastructure componentry to make it happen. And we connect these industrial devices. Here's an application we publicized over the last year or two that we've achieved. It's with the New York Power Authority and the New York Transit authority. So you got the trains running and the electricity in the New York power grid working together. Uh, in the winters, you may not know this, but they have things called track heaters. And the way they turn the track heaters on every October is they have a maintenance individual, highly trained, go out on those rails. And you got to be careful. You can kill yourself out on those rails, not by just the trains, but they have very high voltage. And they would put monstrous capacitors in, click, to turn the heaters on. In April, then they would go back out and take those capacitors out and turn the heaters off. A 50-year-old control system that 95% of the time was wasting electricity because 95% of the time you didn't need to heat your rails. There was no snow. So we developed and deployed with them a wireless control system. Oh, by the way, that pic second picture, first picture was uh, how the heater works on the right, and the second picture is Boston this past winter, and they don't have them running. Notice the difference in the process. But we deployed with a 
partner, a company by the name of CAPS, a wireless control system throughout the network um, around the New York metro area. So now they can just from a control room turn those heater systems on and off based on the weather. Pretty simple story. Wireless, intelligent, works fantastic, saving bazillions of dollars for that, that network. Okay, we're almost done. I want to give you one final thought. You know, in most presentations in the past, if you wanted people to listen or at least think you were a, good, a nice present, presenter, you would, um, you would put a picture of a puppy dog, you know, in your presentation and people go, oh, what a great presenter. Well, I got the new puppy dog. So my one final thought is drones. I love drones. So drones, you know, you can, get, you can buy the drone that irritates your neighbor, right? You can fly it over his house and he gets out his shotgun and shoots it. Um, drones are used in the military right now to save our American uh, warriors' lives, um, very effective. And then I'm waiting for this drone. I'm dying to have a drone de delivered to my house pizza. I just think this is the perfect application. The pizza box is consistent. It's usually three miles from your house. I don't know why this isn't happening yet. I'm dying to see this happen where the pizza delivery guy is a drone, aren't you? This would be perfect. And then how about more importantly, and let's leave you with this image, how about a drone that delivers you? How many of you have seen this picture before? This is the e 184. It's my favorite product. I love the e 184. Who knows about the e 184? Anybody? Oh, you got to get going on this. This is so good. Uh, it's a little startup Chinese company, and they're making a single-seater autonomous drone. This drone will deliver you. It will run for 23 minutes at 60 miles an hour. So basically, you can go 20 miles. If you lived in Chicago and you lived 10 miles from work and you had to go out on that road system to go to work every day, the infamous 10-mile commute that's taking you 45, 50 minutes to get there, or Atlanta, or Houston, or LA, wouldn't it be cool to just go out in your driveway, sit down, and pop over the traffic to work? How cool would that be? You think this is just a prototype. It is not. It is a fully running product. Now, they don't have full certification on it yet, but this product works and it's running. Down in the right-hand corner, it is basically Google Maps. You sit in the drone, touch where you want to go, 15 minutes later, you arrive. Pretty crazy stuff. Yes, it costs $250,000. But I, I would like to challenge your thinking. That's only two and a half Tesla Model S's. So it's not that crazy. Here's what's scary to me. What's scary to me is this is a startup Chinese company. I don't think Boeing came out with this. I don't think General Motors came out with this. If, in my opinion, they should be the companies coming out with this product. But they're not. So this is crazy world we live in, really exciting stuff. I call it IoT in the sky. And uh, by the way, go Google this stuff. It's a really interesting story behind this little company. And I think in the next Olympics, you're going to see a ton of these being demonstrated. Really cool. Oh, and then what you're probably most worried about, if we have an Internet of Things and everything's on the Internet, we're going to run out of IP addresses, right? The engineers in the room know this. We're going to run out of IP addresses. No. Last month... You don't know it, but while you were sleeping, I think Al Gore called the right officials and said, I invented the internet, so fix it. We've got to make sure it's future-proofed. So we all have been living on an IPv4 uh, set of I I IP addresses, which was a 32-bit uh, address, and there were 4.3 billion possible addresses. Don't worry. We've now gone to IPv6, so now there are... 340 unidecillion possible IP addresses. So I think we just future-proof the Internet of Things. That's all I had for you. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Jack, Jack, stick around for a second. You're not... Just because you're the keynote and you get to get this whole thing started, it doesn't mean you're immune oh. from answering the big question. Oh, so how are we going to make things better, safer, smarter, faster in manufacturing starting now? How, what do manufacturers need to do 
in order to take advantage of not only the additional bandwidth you just talked about, but also start to take advantage of the real promise that, uh, that IOT offers? So I, I think Jack. what, oh yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I, I think what we all need to do, and especially the users themselves, I mean, the people that buy the machines and are making products, I think the most important thing for them to do right now is sit, step back and look at what you've been doing and have some young people criticize what you've been doing and just start dreaming on what could be done. Because I think we're all suffering from a massive amount of institutional memory. We've been just living this industrial automation world for the last 20, 30 years. It's been active, it's been solid, it's doing its things. We're doing great things, but I don't think we know what we don't know. We just don't know what to do with some of this stuff. And it's probably back to my last drone image, right? You're not running around thinking a drone might deliver you to work. You know, it's just, so I think we gotta start dreaming quite a bit inside the factory and plants and process plants in this world to come up with whole crazy new ideas on how to tackle the problem. Once we get the mindset fixed, then I think the task is a lot easier. And oh, by the way, it's probably the right time to get the mindset fixed because if you're all baby boom studiers, the mega trend, um, by the way, it's the 70th birthday now of, of the beginning edge of the baby boom. So it was 1946 was the first year of the baby boom. They all just turned 70. Now, they should have been retired for the last five years, but remember the stock market crash in 09? They all went back to work. So very soon now, you're going to get this massive wave of knowledge leave our plants and factories so that that institutional memory is going to leave. The barriers to entry for a lot of this new stuff is going to go out the door. And then the young people with all these, these digital natives that have grown up in this world, they'll start imagining the new world and what we could do with this technology. Um, I, I think that's it first and foremost. We just got to start getting away from our process and start thinking about what we could make it before we get there. The, the safer, the more productive, it, it's all there. It, it's, it's almost a no-brainer. You don't, you don't even, you can't even imagine that by deploying these technologies it wouldn't be safer or it wouldn't be more productive. The, the one thing I said uh, in, the, in the article we, we wrote uh, a month ago, the, the U.S. specifically though has a different challenge. The U.S. specifically has to begin and, and get on to thinking longer term about investment. This is where the world of manufacturing going, but, you, but we have to think long term about our investments. Yep. Automation systems can last for 10 or 15 years and publicly traded companies typically want paybacks in one year on their investments. That's crazy thinking. You and I don't day trade our 401ks, right? We, we shouldn't day trade our manufacturing facilities. We need to think, make investments for the long term and if you put the put that scenario out there, this stuff will start happening a lot faster than we think. Very good. That gives us a great start for the rest of the discussions we'll have today. Once again, my thanks to Jack Nalig, uh, President, Phoenix Contact.